the real lesson is never give up studying and trying to learn from your failure. We have less uh, weapons at the moment to uh, act against the immune cold tumors. Chemo radiation is one of the treatments that causes the highest weight loss and um, also the muscle loss. Welcome to today's edition of uh, Onco Influencers. We are excited to have Dr. Paolo Bossi with us today. Dr. Bossi is an uh, Associate Professor of uh, Medical Oncology at uh, the renowned uh, Humanitas University and International Medical School based in Milan, Italy, built alongside the well-known Humanitas Research and Teaching Hospital. Dr. Bossi obtained his uh, medical degree and oncology specialization from the University of Milan. He's well-recognized key opinion leader in head and neck cancers and uh, non-melanoma skin cancers, as well as uh, quality of life uh, assessments and value-based medicines. He's particularly interested in uh, rare cancers, including the uh, paranasal sinus cancer, nasopharyngeal cancer, and uh, salivary gland cancer. He is uh, very committed to supportive care and is active in uh, multiple organizations. He is currently the chair of the Mucositis Study Group of the Multinational Association of uh, Supportive Care in Cancer and also the president of NICSO, the Italian Supportive Care Group. And he serves on the head and neck work stream of ESMO and is also the chair of the geriatric subcommittee of uh, the EORTC head and neck cancer group. He's an investigator in uh, multiple clinical trials, both uh, international and regional, and has contributed immensely to the understanding of uh, cancer biology through his uh, translational research activities. Dr. Bossi, we are uh, very glad to have you today. It's a pleasure also for me. Thanks for this invitation. So let's start off by uh, asking you a personal question. Please tell us more about yourself where where are you from? Where did you grow up? So I'm I come from a, a small city close to close to Milan, uh, in a very green area. So I grew up uh, in a, in the middle of uh, the parks and very very green area. So it was very good for me for my childhood to spend time and to be uh, close to the nature. So, so I like to pour this uh, walking, running, and going uh, going to the mountains. So it's a very very nice area where where I where I grew up. And so that's a, that's a good environment. I, I my my family was not a link to medicine, so that's a good uh, good thing for me. <laughs> So I, I started uh, studying uh, in the college, and then I chose to to, be, to become a doctor. It was uh, almost a casual decision because I did not uh, really choose uh, medicine as my first option. I would be to be I would uh, prefer to be a journalist, but at that time there was no no good school for journalists. So I, uh, at the end of the day, I chose to be to 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 study medicine, and I I became very passionate to medicine, and and uh, and then so I. I became an oncologist after that. So, in telling a long history in in uh, in, in in one minute. That's uh... excellent, and uh, that already answers partly my second question, uh, which is uh, why did you choose medicine and especially oncology to specialize? And uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more on uh, how you uh, started to focus on uh, head and neck cancers, especially. Yeah, um, I believe that uh, some of my my colleagues uh, um, have my same have the same experience of myself. So because when my father died because of cancer, I was at the fifth year in medicine, and uh, I I would like to do, to study infectious disease because I was very passionate on this. But after uh, this uh, event, uh, I I asked myself how. Uh, I can do something about this. It was my father was very, very young, was 60 years old when he passed away. So I tried to under, to find out something uh, to, I don't know, when you were, when you are young, you, you, you dream to change the world. I would like to change the, the, this, this bad part of my life, trying to do something against this. And so this was the, 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 the real reason why I chose uh, uh, um, oncology as a, as a main spe specialty for my specialization. Then after that, I, I studied oncology and uh, I had the real uh, uh, lack to, uh, to come 
uh, and uh, a student in oncology uh, under the supervision and the mentorship of Lisa Lichitra, who was my uh, my mentor. And she, she's a, a strong person. Uh, and she has a strong personality, but she is very passionate uh, for medicine. And so uh, she, she is a, an expert of head and neck cancer. So that's the reason why I also chose head and neck. I, st I studied, I specialized in uh, oncology with the uh, with the with the thesis of uh, in the nasopharyngeal cancer under the mentorship of Lisa. And then after that, I, I studied in, uh, I was in the uh, in National Cancer Institute in Milan for more than 20 years. And then one day, Lisa told me, it's time that, that you uh, that you grow in another place. So that she's a wonderful mentorship also for this, because she is able to to uh, in encourage people to make choices. So that's a, a really a, a great lesson for my life. Oh, uh, excellent. I think, uh, well, I completely agree to that. And Lisa is a fantastic physician. I cannot uh, uh, I cannot uh, share it fully in detail how much I learned from her. And of course, across the globe, you cannot have worked in head and neck cancer without knowing Lisa. So uh, that's off to Lisa then. Great. Uh, the other question is, uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, your current role? and uh, the specific tumor types you treat uh, apart from uh, head and neck cancer. Yeah, uh, at the moment, uh, I'm the, the chief of the head and neck medical oncology here in Humanities University and uh, in the Humanitas uh, Hospital, who is linked to the university. And I am guiding a group of uh, four physicians and uh, some translational researchers. So this is a, a mixed group where we try to perform the, we tried, you know, if we are really able to do it, we try to perform the, the bench to bedside and the bedside to bench research, trying to understand understand better the mechanisms, the molecular mechanism of head and neck cancer, and trying to put uh, in uh, act uh, some studies uh, to counteract these mechanisms uh, in uh, in all the setting of head and neck cancer. So starting from the premalignant lesions, uh, going to recurrent metastatic diseases. At, apart from head and neck cancer, I treat also non-melanoma skin cancer, so basically cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma, basal, basal cell carcinoma, and a rarer form of uh, cutaneous cancer like Merkel cancer or adenexal cancer. So they're very, very rare cancer in, uh, in the skin, no, that are differently treated from uh, melanoma cancer. So the, the idea of this group is really to focus on these two types of diseases and try to uh, increase the knowledge to educate people. We are a center where the several uh, meetings, educational meeting congresses are organized by ourselves so because we would like really to increase the research and to focus on this specific cancer because we know that uh, this is a cancer that is usually, I'm speaking about red neck cancer, usually it is not so so well considered by by the society by the other physicians sometimes this it is a really neglected cancer so we would like to, to offer to increase the knowledge about this cancer and in the same time to try to uh, discover new treatment modalities and to change if possible the practice uh, to increase survival in uh, in this in this type of cancer it's really a challenge sometimes. I have to say that we uh, lose many battles also in this, in this, uh, in this disease and in the, in the type of, of trials we are designing. We, are, we, we have lost many opportunities, but we have also lost by fighting. So that's uh, something that uh, reassures ourselves. So we are trying to, uh, to fight, but uh, uh, only a few times you can succeed in this type of cancer. But however, the, 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 real, the real lesson is never give up uh, studying and trying to learn from your failure, trying to increase the knowledge, trying to, to find out something more in, uh, to, to discover mechanisms, pathways, and to discover how to better uh, treat these type of cancers. Okay. Uh, what are the latest uh, treatment innovations in head and neck cancer? especially in the recurrent metastatic setting, which uh, I have seen over the decades, has really been an area with a huge unmet need. Yeah, that's really error and unmet need because patients are suffering from this disease, are suffering from the, the burden of symptoms linked to this disease, and the, the overall survival has been stuck on for 
uh, many years on uh, less than one year. So when you have a recurrent metastatic at the next common cell carcinoma, you knew that uh, at the, the median OS uh, it was uh, at uh, one year and less. Now with the new improvement in the immunotherapy, the combination of immunotherapy and the treatment sequencing, we are able to raise this bar and we have achieved 14, 15 months of, of a median overall survival with the last uh, trials that have been published. So I believe that this is the main challenge, this main um, novelty in the treatment of recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer. Try to integrate immunotherapy into the treatment journey. Then there is another important factor that we have not uh, succeeded yet to discover, and it is to identify biomarkers to understand who is the patient who should receive immunotherapy alone, who is the patient who should receive chemotherapy plus immuno? Who is the patient who will not gain any benefit from immunotherapy? And linked to this discussion, there is the topic of how to increase the response to immunotherapy, how to make some immune excluded tumors as immune inflamed ones. Because we know that uh, in these three categories, so the immune inflamed, immune excluded, and immune cold environment, what we could uh, really tackle is the immune excluded and immune inflamed. We have less uh, uh, weapons at the moment uh, to uh, act against the immune cold tumors. So we have to concentrate on these two uh, subtypes of tumor and try to understand how to ameliorate the, the, the treatment in this type of cancer. What we can do is try to implement with new strategies. We have immunotherapy, but uh, lastly, we have new, new type of treatments, uh, by specific antibodies, combination of uh, immunotherapy plus targeted agents, combination of immunotherapy plus vaccines, therapeutic vaccines in HPV positive recurrent metastatic uh, patient. So these improvements uh, represent the future for this uh, group of patients. We have to invest uh, our energy a little bit more. And what I believe, what I strongly believe is that the research that came from the industry is very important. We cannot uh, do anything without the industry. We have to support the industry for this type of research, and that's very good. But in parallel, we have to invest the time, money, and research into the academic uh, part of the research. So trying to identify biomarkers, try to identify better sequencing, new combination, and new um, personalized treatment. This is part is typically part of the academic research. And we need more academic research in the, in the head and neck field, in the head and neck cancer field. So that's uh, something that I have learned during the, these years when I started, uh, um, uh, since I started uh, commit my commitment with head and neck cancer, but these two type of research should go in parallel. Sometimes they, they can meet together, but the, we have to put the same energy in, uh, in, the, in two big fields of actions. Great. Uh, with respect to this uh, immunotherapies, you also mentioned uh, the bispecific T cell receptor uh, agents and so on. With all of these innovations taking place, what is the role of uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and chemoradiotherapy in head and neck cancer as of today? Yeah. Basically, what we know is that uh, at the moment, at least for locally advanced cancer with a treated with a curative intent, uh, what we know for the moment is that surgery plus chemoradiation or chemoradiation alone for locally advanced disease uh, maintains their role and they are still the benchmark for our intervention. So the, the prognosis of our patient depends on these uh, three main treatments, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. So that's the, the, pack, the treatment package that can give our patient the best uh, uh, survival. However, the integration of immunotherapy, even in the local advanced setting, is something that could uh, raise the bar of survival, could raise the bar of organ preservation and improvement in quality of life. Last week, we had the, the press release that has been, re that has been released uh, uh, 
um, thanks to the results of the Keynote 689 trial that showed, at least according to these uh, few sentences of the press release, they showed an event-free survival benefit for the group of patients randomized to receive immunotherapy before and after surgery. So that's a completely new field. For the first time, we have a randomized trial in the local advanced setting showing a benefit for immunotherapy. In the past, we had a few trials, randomized trials, that failed to show an improvement of adding immunotherapy to radiation therapy in a, and to radiation and chemo radiation. So the add-on immunotherapy to this benchmark, to this, to this concurrent chemo red at the same time is not useful, at least for the general population of head and neck cancer. But according to this last data, maybe putting immunotherapy before surgery and after surgery plus chemo radiation could be and should be a new treatment, a new choice that, that will increase event-free survival and at the end of the day, uh, overall survival. So that's a real challenge for us. It's important, uh, a new and a novelty for the field. It's uh, about uh, uh, 15 to 20 years that no new drug have appeared in the local advanced setting. I'm not speaking about metastatic, but in the local advanced setting, there was no news for this type of cancer. And now we could really integrate something more. This is just the beginning of a, maybe of a new treatment approach that needs more and more research and it's more and more uh, ideas to better in, for a better integration. But uh, we know that uh, we are quite reassured by the fact that uh, this has helped some patient in that trial. So maybe it could help uh, many, many other patients. So we'll see this data maybe in, an, in a Congress next year, and we'll be able to elaborate a little bit more on how the resource, this particular field of research should go ahead. Okay. Uh, we have seen the past decades that uh, the demography of the head and neck cancer patients uh, in the Western world uh, has uh, slowly started to shift to uh, more of a HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer. So this patient population has been increasing. And we also know that uh, these patients, uh, uh, the overall profile is a bit different to uh, what used to be the historical head and neck cancer patient. Now, the question is, based on the current uh, different kinds of immunotherapies and other uh, treatment options available, are HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer patients treated differently? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the real question, uh, the hot question for head and neck cancer specialists, uh, how to be, uh, deal with HPV-positive cancers. First, uh, just to tell you that uh, no randomized trial at this time exists showing that we can really safely de-escalate uh, the treatment in HPV positive cancer patient. Because this is the question, how if you can uh, gain real good survival in HPV positive cancer, but uh, at the price of high toxicity, may we maintain, may we keep this good survival, but reducing the amount of toxicity of the treatment? This is the real challenge. Now we have different uh, treatment approaches that have, that uh, have been studied and are are, sta are in clinical trials uh, at the moment. I would like just to cite some of them, just to let you know how different is the, the scenario and the treatment paradigm where HPV, HPV positive cancer can go. So let's start from surgery. There are a few trials. One, the, one of the most important is the PATHOS trial that is trying to put surgery since the beginning for HPV positive cancer and try, thanks to surgery, to de-escalate the dose of radiation or try to avoid chemotherapy in the post-operative setting. This is a randomized clinical trial after surgery. All the patients receive surgery, and then they have different type of randomization to answer this question. So this is the first trial. Another trial that has been recently presented at ASCO compared intensity modulating radiation therapy with intensity modulation proton therapy for this type of cancer. And the author showed the same survival, but less toxicity in particular for the swallowing and the nutrition. So that's just 
uh, few data, but we can that should be reinforced by other data to accept the fact that the proton therapy can help HP positive cancer patients. Then we can move to the idea of identifying who are the patients who could receive less radiation. And uh, one of these uh, methods could be identifying a biomarker. And one of the possible biomarkers that has been recently presented is, is the hypoxia uh, biomarker through F-mesopet. Uh, this is a trial that has been presented recently at ASCO and uh, in a trial that is ongoing, a randomized trial is ongoing. Uh, if by evaluating after 30 grades of radiation, who are the patient who maintains some hypoxic area who should receive a high dose radiation plus cisplatin? And who are the patient that after 30 grades of radiation are completely negative for the hypoxic microenvironment? So this patient may safely receive only 30 grades of radiation and two doses of cisplatin. So this patient really de-escalated. So let's think 30 grades against 70 grades. And the recent data presented by Nancy Lee at ESCO showed that this is a very, very interesting way to proceed for a randomized clinical trial. So the, the trial has just started. And in a few years, uh, I believe that the enthusiasm towards this biomarker will increase. So that would be the first way to tailor the treatment according to this biomarker. Another biomarker that is really very, very interesting is the ctDNA, HPV ctDNA, cell-free DNA, that uh, could identify the patient that at a certain part of the treatment uh, are negative uh, for the circulating DNA. So uh, it means that this patient maybe can be safely escalated or the patient who need to stay on the highest dose of the treatment because they maintain a, a liquid biopsy positive. And so the, we should aim at increasing the dose of, and maintaining the high dose of radiation therapy. So these, in a nutshell, are the type of treatments that I could identify as being promising for the future for HPV. Just one minute to tell you that not all the HPV positive are created equal because we have some T4 and N3 disease where something more could be done. These are the patients that should not be de-escalated, but maybe should be escalated. And for this patient, receiving immunotherapy sometimes, maybe before or before and after, could be a reasonable choice for the future. So you can see how multifaceted is the treatment approach to HPV-positive cancer for the future, and it's a really challenging, exciting part of the of the question, I would say. Thank you. Now, shifting gears a bit, you play a very important role in the Multinational Association for Supportive Care of Cancer. You're also the president of the Supportive Care Network in Italy. We know that one of the patient groups that uh, has been, uh, uh, let's say, neglected to a certain extent is patients suffering from cachexia. What is new for these patients? Is there some hope for cachexia patients? Yeah, cachexia in head and neck cancer has uh, two basic causes. The first one is the disease. As you know, that uh, you prevent people from eating and swallowing. So that's the causes of, of uh, anorexia, cachexia, and the weight loss sarcopenia. And the other cause is the treatment. Chemo radiation is one of the treatments that causes the highest weight loss and also the muscle loss. So it's very aggressive treatment, I would say. So we encourage our colleagues to put in act any the, the, the strongest supportive care since the beginning. So the nutritional evaluation, the nutritional support in starting from the prehabilitation of this patient. So before starting radiation or before surgery, that's a really a crucial point for ourselves because uh, for our patient because it's important to support this patient. This, uh, I believe, is the most important uh, uh, key factor um, tried to support since the beginnings. 
Then for the future, there is a, a possible compound that's uh, really uh, pro promising for, for me. It's the, uh, the, the history of Ponsegromab. It's a, a, a drug that acts, to, acts against the GDF-15 that has been shown as a biomarker of, uh, biomarker, as, a, as a, an actor of the of causing cachexia and causing a stress to, 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 the, to the body, the acting uh, during the, the uh, uh, processes that causes stress to the body and causing at the end of the day cachexia. So this um, drug acts, acts against GDF-15 that is elevated in head and neck cancer, very high in, in head and neck cancer before and during the treatment. So this is a, a possible uh, drug that could support uh, this type of patient. There are randomized clinical trials ongoing in other diseases, pancreatic, lung cancer, and colon cancer. But I believe that head and neck cancer is one of the fields where this drug could also help a lot of our patients. The story has to be written. I believe that we will write a strong part of this history as an head and neck cancer specialist. And I believe that this is another another brick to be added to increase the supportive care to our patient and at the end of the day to ameliorate quality of life and improve overall survival in this group of patients. It's very uh, good to hear that. And uh, one final question is, uh, what is your message to the head and neck cancer patients out there? What can they look forward as treatment options in the next decade? So my main message is that uh, head and neck cancer should be um, dealt, should be uh, discussed in a multidisciplinary way in centers with expertise and numbers for treating this type of cancer. This, we have we have data saying that uh, clearly saying that uh, the the importance of the expertise of the group uh, that is treating head and neck cancer patients. So this is my main message. That's very important. What I what I uh, look for the future is uh, having more compounds, uh, more drugs, uh, and having being able to integrate in a multidisciplinary way these compounds by a good treatment sequencing in every setting of disease. So just a, the, my the last message uh, in, uh, I believe that the, the history of neck cancer should start from the oral potentially malignant diseases. So since the beginning, if we are able to intercept the, this type of disease and to prevent the malignant transformation. And there are many studies and trials ongoing. We are uh, really fighting in this field. That's, uh, I believe it's one of the major part uh, for uh, having uh, less patients with head and neck cancer in, uh, and uh, to be able to intercept the cancer transformation. Uh, so these are the fields uh, of action for the future where we may be able to reduce the burden of disease at the end of the day, improve the prognosis of this, of this type of patients. Uh, with that, thanks a lot for the message. I uh, sincerely hope that uh, this is uh, what we work towards in the future. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for uh, your time and for all the insights uh, you gave us. Thanks a lot and uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.